Hello everyone, today we will be uh, doing an overview of the DSM and Mental Health Act. This is picking up uh, from where we left off on Monday to give uh, more understanding around the DSM and Mental Health Act and why they're important to understand in our relational work with clients. So the DSM in review. The DSM is an acronym that stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It was developed by the American Psychological Association and is referred to as a critical guidebook for clinicians. You might have heard of it in practice as a psychiatric bible really for mental health professionals because this DSM provides a list of all the mental disorders that currently um, meet standards for diagnosis and it will list all the criteria for each of those uh, disorders. And so in, in practice, when assessing an individual uh, with mental health symptoms, if they meet a certain number of criteria listed under a particular disorder, they will meet the diagnosis of that disorder. So this is really important to understand because it does um, provide us insight into what their collection of symptoms mean and also it provides a means of communicating with other mental health professionals in practice. The DSM uh, is a framework for diagnosing mental illness in patients and it also provides recommendations for treatment in this manual. Uh, I remember most um, recently in child and youth mental health practice, uh, nurses would engage in the provisional diagnosis of clients um, who would come in, children and youth, with mental health uh, related symptoms. And so we would uh, really engage in an assessment um, of that child and bring the family in to collect their observations and impressions and we'd write a report and from that report uh, we would uh, provide uh, provisional diagnoses which uh, were just the best guesstimation at that point from what we were seeing and this would assist the psychiatrist in determining what was a, the primary um, diagnosis in this case what will be um, the focal point for treatment of the individual so we do have uh, some risks and limitations that present when looking at the DSM. When we engage in a critical analysis of the DSM, there are questions that come up, um, such as, what if the person has a condition that is not in the DSM? Are there actual mental disorders or are they a social construct designed by society to classify people who do not meet our cultural and societal norms? And are mental disorders even real? So these are some of the questions that emerge uh, when we look at the DSM and how can we really definitively say a mental illness exists. Really, the DSM is informed by research uh, and it does provide a systematic um, look at all the mental disorders that um, have presented in practice and their specific criteria. So we do uh, want to be cognizant of the limitations um, as well of the DSM and that we want to really be aware that we don't reduce the individual to their diagnosis. This would be adopting a reductionistic um, view of the client and would not be helpful in our relational work with that client and their family. So we, we want to really challenge that Cartesian view of health um, and the Cartesian view really speaks to the, the medical mo model and really gives credence to that medical model as the overarching model. Um, we don't uh, want to adopt a model that reduces a client to their signs and symptoms and treatment. Uh, we really want to understand the unique complexity of the individual, their subjective experience of their illness, uh, what were the factors that led up to the the illness experience? How do they make meaning of that? All of these questions um, really uh, speak to and are relevant to a humanistic lens in nursing practice where we honor the unique individual and recognize all the factors in their life that have culminated to create where that individual is at this time. We also honor their connections to family, to the workplace, um, to um, relationships in their life, uh, social, marital, um, occupational relationships, their financial status. We look at all uh, relevant domains of their life and um, take that into, into consideration when we work with them so that we're sensitive to some key issues. So this is all part of humanistic and holistic practice as a nurse. 
So looking at this example of Miss Smith and how the multi-axial system of diagnosing comes into play. So you'll see here that there are five axes listed along the left-hand side. It goes axis one through to axis five. Now this is, um, this is the way that diagnoses would be written um, using the DSM-4. This is um, changing now with the DSM-5. They've proposed a different approach to uh, listing the diagnoses and um, the level of functionality for that client. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about that here. But uh, as you'll see in your textbook, there's still reference to uh, the DSM-4. And so it's, um, it's important to recognize that the DSM-5 is fairly fresh, just being released in May of this year. And because um, this information is so new, it hasn't been updated yet in our textbook. So we'll continue to look at the DSM-4 in this case and explore what the multi-axial system really refers to. So axis one will describe the clinical disorder, the primary focus of clinical attention. Axis two defines personality disorders and or mental retardation if present. You'll see, for example, a diagnosis of maybe dissociative identity disorder under axis two. Um, also, you might see under axis two uh, a diagnosis of learning disability. So that, those would be examples there of an axis 2 uh, disorder. Axis 3 lists general medical conditions, for example, diabetes, asthma, um, COPD. You would see listed here. And this is directly relevant to the care we provide. We want to understand not just the, the mental health piece, but the physical health piece and how the two can interact. Axis 4 lists any psychosocial environmental problems that may produce additional stress uh, for that person and they're relevant to the treatment of the individual. So it's important for us to know that there are some occupational problems. Uh, perhaps the person has some social difficulties um, interacting with colleagues and getting along there and that produced a lot of mental stress for that person. We also want to look at the marital relationship. And in this case for Ms. Smith, there was a marital breakdown. These all are all really important for understanding um, some of their um, levels of functioning in these areas of life, social, occupational, financial, for example. And um, just look at the, the link between these problems and the level of stress that the patient's experiencing. Axis 5 is uh, the Global Assessment of Functioning, also known as the GAF score. Now this score uh, ranges from 0 to 100. 0 to 10 is considered low functioning, 90 to 100 is considered high functioning. You'll see in this example the client has a GAF score of 35, which indicates that she's having significant impairment in work and relationships. So it speaks to the level of functioning in different spheres of life, the social, occupational, and um, psychological spheres of life. But uh, it's important to note that this GAF score is probably uh, one of the least understood and most misused parts of the multi-axial system. It really doesn't measure disability well or indicate what areas of the patient's life require uh, attention. It's just a number on the screen, uh, on the page, for example, in the client's report. And uh, we really have to look closer at what that means and, you know, how was that value assigned? Because it can be very subjective. So this is an example of the multi-axial system and in the DSM-5 they're doing away with this, combining different axes and looking at more of a dimensional perspective um, in terms of the level of severity for different indicators. Um, they'll rank a level of severity for example for occupational um, functioning, social functioning, psychological functioning and um, it will look much different and we don't yet know really, it's not yet clear how this will look in practice because the DSM-5 Five is so new. This is an excellent video clip about seven minutes long and it provides an overview of the DSM and the multi-axial diagnostic system. I encourage you to watch it uh, because it really just deepens that understanding of the DSM and uh, here is the link. I have posted it to Blackboard Learn as well under interesting websites. 
Now, the Mental Health Act informs mental health law in BC, and it provides information related to the rights of the patient and the powers of psychiatric professionals. The Mental Health Act has four guiding principles as listed on this slide. Now, these principles um, are applicable to the client um, who is being certified and involuntarily admitted to the psychiatric facility. So the term certification refers to this involuntary admission of the client to the designated facility because of the principles outlined above. When a person is certified, they have the medical certificate that's been completed by a physician, and this certificate has to be completed at certain times to be able to hold the person for a designated period of time. And we'll cover this in the next slide. So a medical doctor must sign that certificate. It doesn't necessarily need to be a psychiatrist, just a medical doctor. So the Mental Health Act provides assistance to people with serious mental disorders who refuse to accept psychiatric treatment because their illness prevents them from recognizing that need for assistance. There are cases where a person is so ill they don't recognize that they are ill and don't have insight into having a disorder. So this is when they need to receive treatment and care. And typically, uh, the police will come to that, the home of the person and transport them to the ER, apprehending them under Section 28 of the Mental Health Act um, so they can be admitted to the ER and assessed uh, by a physician to determine you know, whether or not they have a mental illness and whether uh, that illness warrants treatment in a designated facility. So that first medical certificate that is signed by the physician uh, will hold the person for 48 hours. Within that 48 hour time period, a second medical certificate needs to be signed to hold that person for a month's time from the admission date. And then that certificate can be renewed for another month, three months, and six months thereafter as needed. Now it's important to note that the Mental Health Act does protect the rights of the individual with mental illness. Form 13 outlines the rights of the client and these include the right to a second medical opinion and to an explanation regarding the reasons for certification. So the person should have it explained to them why they're being admitted to the hospital, why they require care. It's important to know as well that the person with mental illness can request a review panel hearing and this is where they can speak for themselves or have a lawyer speak for them to present their case and determine whether or not they should uh, be held uh, involuntarily. So here is a link to learning modules that walk you through the Mental Health Act. And this is a very helpful tool because there's a pre-test and post-test and it really keeps you engaged throughout. So these questions that you see in this, uh, this learning module uh, form, they might appear on an upcoming midterm or final exam. So just FYI, very important document to check out if you haven't already. So for discussion, what are your reactions to the Mental Health Act? Have there been instances where you've seen the Mental Health Act employed? For example, in a family situation, maybe a friend or a patient or client you've been responsible for? Do you think a client's status under the Mental Health Act impacts the type of care you provide? There may be situations where an involuntary client is resistant to care if they don't have insight into their disorder and don't believe they need treatment. Involuntary clients may require more encouragement to talk and understand why they are in the hospital and the need for the treatment. So this has direct relational implications in the way we work with clients who are certified. And I encourage you to think about relational tools that you can use when engaging clients who may be resistant to care and pose unique challenges to our nursing practice.